Welcome back to Documentary First, a behind-the-scenes look at the girl who wore freedom, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay, and with me as always is the first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, how you doing? Very good, and as always, Jason Rugg. Hey there. Jason is our research guy, sound guy, um, help us Just out. Whatever with, you need me to be. Yeah, you well, I mean, be. ultimately, he's an editor, and so he has a. Once we get to the editing part and other stuff, he'll have a lot more to say. But for maybe. right now, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> now, Jason is working on stuff right now. But can you tell us about anything you're working on right now? Like for the Girl of War Freedom, or no, 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 no. Beyond just that, just in general, just so we can learn more about Jason. So I work for Phil Vischer. Uh, if you've ever seen the Mr. Phil Show, which is our new show, uh, Phil back in the day created Veggie Tales, and now we're making the Mr. Phil Show. Um, and several other devotional shorts um, that you can see on Right Now Media. And I'm the production manager for his company. So I do basically all the editing, the anime, and then I manage a small team of editors and animators. You realize that you're a production manager and like five other things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the production manager is kind of the umbrella title. Right, it's just right, like right. it's the coolest sounding one, so you just go for that. Right. Yeah. But that means – well, Christian, you are the producer of A Girl Who Wore Freedom. I am. And the, the director, director and, and the fundraiser and, and the social media coordinator and <laughs> probably caterer yes, and everything. counselor and I'll tell you what I'm not. Okay. I am not the technical guru. guru. I am not the cinematographer. I am not the DP. Uh, I am not the editor. We have lots of other people that are involved. You, you found those people. I absolutely partnered with some amazing people. And so would you, for someone who wants to make their own documentary, I mean, is that the way to go? Or should you be learning these skills? Or do you... You know, I have to, I have to say that teamwork and, um, you know, having sort of a film family is crucial. It's, it's impossible to work this closely with people on something this difficult with people that you don't absolutely respect and enjoy working with. And we're definitely going to talk about how you built your team and, and where you met people and that kind of stuff in upcoming podcasts. Um, today, what I want to get jump into is the what came next. So last time we were talking about you were in France. You learned about the celebration of D-Day over there. You were inspired. You met a wonderful family there. You actually met the girl who wore freedom. Then you came home. What happened next? Yeah, well, so, you know, I, rem- I remember thinking when I first met this family, the Boucherie family, gosh, we really need to make a documentary about this story. Uh, And I really felt like America had no idea what happened over there and needed to learn, you know, what the French are doing um, for, you know, us every single year for our American soldiers. And – but then I just, you know, uh, that's what I thought. That was about the sum of it. And I remember saying to this family, you know, if you ever get to America, you know, come and visit me. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, when you say that to someone in Normandy who's been dying to get to America their whole lives. They'll all, do it. They will do it. And so Flo Boucherie um, told me that she wanted to come and visit me uh, for Christmas in 2015. And she told me that she had booked her ticket for three weeks <laughs> and she was coming over. And I, my husband and my sons about had a conniption. They're like, what? We don't even have our own family over there uh, for this long. But what I've learned about people in Europe is they, they don't just go somewhere for a few days. Like if they're going to make a big trip, they go for a month. You know, and um, they get certain vacations throughout the year, and they decide that if they're going to really save their money and they're going to make the best of it. So, Flo came for three weeks, and it was life changing for my family. They I'm now sure want her every Christmas. She made bouche to Noels, and she made chicken Flo, and she made all sorts of the Normandy food is amazing. And so they and they don't eat out a lot. They cook almost every meal. So um, she just brought a lot of added value to that Christmas, and she had Christmas presents that she'd made for us. It was incredible. But the thing for me was that I got to know more about her and more about her family story. Well, it helps if you live with someone for three weeks. Yes. <laughs> yes. They all of a sudden become family. But I, you know, and I learned just incredible stuff about, you know, the occupation that I never knew, about the liberation, you know, about her grandparents and just brand new things that I'd never known or understood about World War II. So having Flo live with you, getting to know her and, more importantly, her family's story, and really helped 
grow that seed of an idea of making the documentary. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay. So then from there, you've never made a documentary before. Right. So what? It, uh, like, where do you go from there? Well, I really – so that was Christmas 2015. 2016, I consider my year of just percolation, you know. I was researching – I was talking to other producers who have made documentaries before. Um, I was trying to understand if I did this, how I would do this. Um, so I was researching the family more, the history of the Normandy region, the different towns, and I was making up a list of if I was – it was still, if I ever did this, you know, what would I need? So you mentioned talking to other filmmakers who produce documentaries – how do you do that? Do you, how do you just walk up to someone? Well, truthfully, the way that I did it was Chicago is a – I mean, we're very fortunate. We live in a – you know, the third biggest sort of film industry market. Um, and um, I, you know, was involved in that entertainment world. So I knew people – who knew people. Okay. And so I began volunteering to work on people's things for free. <laughs> 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 All right. And that, that makes me think of, uh, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I hate to do this, but uh, my date with Drew was, that's how he uh, was working to get towards Drew Barrymore was <laughs> seven degrees of, you know, Kevin Bacon, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> the, the whole like, who, who do you know that knows so-and-so? And, and so he used his contacts who knew people, who knew people, and uh, it's, which sounds like basically what you did, is yes, that right? Yes, that's exactly what I did. Okay. Which, that's exactly how I got my job here. How's that? Is I volunteered to help Bill Ebel uh, record a play that his kids were in because I knew <gasps> someone who was friends with his kids. Right. And he was asking around for volunteer camera guys. I volunteered. And then when I needed an internship, I said, hey, do you guys need an intern? And he said, no, not really, but come on. <laughs> and so Bill Ebel used to work for Phil. Yep. And so he, he, Phil, he, Bill was working for Phil at that time. Yep. You volunteered. That's when I met you. Yeah. Uh, and, and Bill is connected. now the editor on The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Yep. Look at how this, I mean, it's that <laughs> tangled web. It is kind of crazy. Yeah. But truthfully, that whole thing about volunteering for free, um, I can't, I can't uh, explain how important that is. Because... Mm. People, oh, as, as, as far as meeting new people, when you have start, opportunities yes. And, yeah. I mean, I got involved in the Illinois <clears throat> Production Alliance. I got involved in women in film. I got involved in all these different things in my area, and I, I volunteered to help people that were doing it. They right. were actually creating the so work. So you could be doing it, as yeah, well, I, in I, some degree. I, I say that I got a graduate degree in the entertainment industry. During those years, you know, by volunteering, I learned so many different things that have served me well since then. Another thing you mentioned that you did in 2016 was doing a lot of research. So what, what type of research did you do, things you studied to learn? Because it's one thing to make a film, but a documentary film is – you know, different than a, you know, yeah. a fictional narrative. Well, film. I had to learn my subject matter. So I had to learn about this family. I had to learn. I mean, you know, it was like doing um, Ancestry.com, seriously, except I was, you know, it was first person research. I was talking with the family members. I was asking more questions. I was figuring out the direction of the story. Um, and then I had to learn about, you know, the beginning of the end of World War II. I had to learn about D-Day. I had to learn, you know, about all the preparations up to that. I I had to learn, you know, where to research, where to find out things. Um, I had to figure out what resources were at my disposal. Um, I began watching films. Like, I, for years, refused to watch Band of Brothers because it was, you know, violent. I didn't like violent movies. and um, But I forced myself to do that because it was critical to me understanding what happened in those first few days. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of the things that you know I mentioned earlier about your career was you are a successful voiceover actress. Um, and I'm sorry, do you call yourself actress? Yes. Okay, good. And uh, but in 2016, something changed. What happened in 2016? Yes. Well, in 2016, I had a like a blockbuster year, like almost a hundred thousand dollars I made on voiceover work. It was oh, wow. awesome okay. for somebody that's kind of like <laughs> new, newly in there. And um, 2017. Everything stopped. It all dried up. 
I was at the time, well, I still am, a voice for Pandora. And so that year, I mean, I had just just killed it with Pandora. And for whatever reason, they brought on new people in 2016. And in 2017, my work completely dried up from Pandora and, you know, from other places. I can't explain it, but it did. And so I can remember sitting in my office one day going, hmm, I don't have anything to do. <laughs> like, what do I do today? And I thought, well, I've been talking about this documentary. Maybe I should just do it. And, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Right. I don't like being bored. I had a story to tell, but I had just been, you know, occupying myself with research. And I that was a pivotal moment sitting in my office. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So what was... And we don't have enough time to get into the full story of it, but when you say, okay, I'm going to do it, I mean, you've researched it, you've thought about it, you've talked to people, so you know, or you have an idea of how to get started, but what was that first thing that you did? The first thing that I had to do was I had to call someone who was going to help me put together a pitch packet. A pitch packet. Do you want to talk about that now? Uh, well, it's kind of, yeah, I can do that. So a pitch packet is basically like, here's my idea. You know, this is um, this is my outline. Mm-hmm. You know, this is my log line, my like germ of an idea. Kind of like here's my beginning, middle, end. Yeah, it's of. like well, when you ever you watch a movie and it'll say, you know, my date with Drew, a blah 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 blah. It's like your elevator pitch. You know, it's that tagline, <laughs> uh, okay. whatever it is. Sure, sure. Um, so that's the log line, and then the synopsis is a short synopsis of what the film is about, a little bit more fleshed out. Um, and then, you know, some people will have a director statement or something else, you know, structure. They'll have lots of different things in this pitch deck, pictures, who the principal players are, um, you know, who the cast is. And it'll be in a document that you can share with other people to tell them what you're going to do. So basically you're casting a vision. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. This is often where filmmakers, want to be filmmakers, say things like, this film, it's like Die Hard meets Cinderella, right? <laughs> right. So now, now right. you know exactly what I'm trying to make here, right? Yeah, you have, to, you have to say, this is what I see in my mind's eye. It looks like this. It's going to sound like this. This is the story that it's going to tell. This is how I'm going to tell it. Um, this is the audience that it's going to be for. This is my timeline. This is how much it's going to cost me. So you're, you're, it's a proposal, mm-hmm. really, you know, and you use that document to begin conversations with people. Um, to get if, them involved in somehow it, or introduce you to people, exactly. I imagine. Okay. Yeah. So and that was the very first thing I did. I'm just curious. I mean, maybe you don't know, but – how much of that document do you think has changed since the, the all the all the germs of it are the same? Um, it's just since then, like everything gets more professional as time goes oh, okay. along, and you m- learn the mistakes and the holes, and you you know you redo them. Plus, I've brought more professional people on, so over time, and they, and they have more buy in. And so, for sure, um, my uh, partner now, Terry Jun at Reverse Negative, one of the v- biggest things he did is he is a graphic artist. Um, he's an incredibly creative guy, and he gave me uh, the first very like s- moving image that we now use kind of for everything. It's like our poster and everything else. And so that changed the look of the film. And when I partnered with Reverse Negative, a lot changed. But that was my second partner. So we'll have to get into that whole dynamic You've later. You've multiple I have, people coming, partnering yeah. with you on the film. Yeah. All right. So truthfully, most of them have stayed there from the very beginning. Lars Ulberg, um and Sandy Gordon, they're still consultants to this day. I mean, I've been friends with them for, you know, almost 20 years. And um, yeah, but I've kind of gone through, some, some people have come and gone. It's been a two-year project, so. It's a long time. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, why don't we wrap up for today, and um, and we can learn more about those stories next time. Yeah. Can I tell everybody where they can go and learn more about the film? Yes, please. And you can see what was or what's in our pitch deck. Um, if you go to normandystories.com, that is our main webpage. You can see our trailers there, other videos that we've made. You can see the log line, synopsis, and background. Uh, you can see our cast and crew. You can also see where to donate. We're still raising money to pay for editing, so um, check that out. That'll be a good lesson for you to – or how you might want to raise your own money. Um, but yeah, normandystories.com, also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. 
All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Next time on Documentary First, we will talk about the day job. You know, how do you prepare? What did you learn? Um, the importance of, you know, how to fuel the creative journey and what worked, what didn't work, and so on. Awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.